In this video, we'll be discussing, first and foremost, the nature of virtue in general. Secondly, we'll be discussing the cardinal and intellectual virtues. This is the most important division of virtue. The cardinal virtues, or moral virtues, on the one hand, and the intellectual virtues on the other hand. We'll discuss what these are and what, what falls underneath this division. For Aristotle, whenever you ask what something is, you must first categorize it. That is, determine in which of the most general sorts of things, i.e. categories, it belongs. So when we ask what is virtue, the first step is to figure out which of the categories virtue belongs to. We have to categorize virtue. For Aristotle, there are ten categories, that is, ten most general sorts of things. These are substance, which itself is subdivided into primary or individual substance and substantial quality. Secondly, quantity. Thirdly, accidental quality. Fourth, relation. Fifth, when. Sixth, where. Seventh, position. Eighth, habit. And nine, action and 10, passion. So these are the 10 most general sorts of things, or 10 categories in which anything can be categorized according to Aristotle. Let's look at some examples. Examples of substance are dog, tree, and human. Uh, and as we saw before, substance is divided into primary or individual substance on the one hand, and substantial qualities on the other hand. Examples of primary or individual substances are Socrates, Sarah, and Clifford. Examples of substantial qualities are rational, two-legged, winged, and mammalian. Examples of quantity are five feet tall, four miles long. Examples of accidental quality are healthy, strong, blue, cold, triangular, circular. Examples of relation are larger, smaller, father, son, perception, perceptible. In a word, anything which is defined only in relation to something else. Examples of when and where are noon, evening, or in the store, at the museum. Examples of position are sitting, standing, lying down, etc. Examples of habit are married, clothed, and owner. Examples of action and passion have to do with our motions, which are either active or passive. So active mo motions, which are actions, are things like hitting, running, and talking, whereas passive motions, or passions, are things like being hit, being burnt, and being thrown. So these are the 10 categories, or 10 most general sorts of things in which anything can be categorized. Into which of these categories do we place virtue? What sort of thing is virtue? Well, we could answer this uh, in the following way. When we ask what sort of thing is that, we are looking for someone to answer by stating the thing's substantial quality or accidental quality. But when we ask about a person, what sort of person is he? One, uh, one answer that can be given is, he is a virtuous person, or he is a vicious, that is, bad person. This indicates to us that virtue is a quality. It's something that answers the question, what sort of thing is this? Or what sort of thing is that? So virtue is a quality, and vice also vice being the opposite of virtue, is also a quality. But are vice and virtue substantial or accidental qualities? If they're accidental qualities, then they're in the category of accidental quality. But if they are substantial qualities, then they're in the category substance. Let's uh, figure out whether virtue and vice are accidental or substantial qualities. Qualities are modes that determine what sort of thing something is. If the determination is essential and cannot change, then the mode is sub a substantial quality. If the determination is changeable, then the mode is an accidental quality. For instance, rational, two-legged, winged, and mammalian are all qualities which are essential and cannot change. A dog cannot cease to be mammalian and a bird cannot cease to be winged. So this is a quality which is substantial. On the other hand, Socrates being tan or pale is an accidental quality because it's something that is not essential to him and can change. 
but virtue and vice are not essential and can change. A person who once was not a bad person can become a bad person later on. Therefore, virtue and vice are accidental qualities of a person. So when we ask, what is virtue? The first part of our answer is to categorize it. And we've just categorized a virtue. We've put it in the category quality, or accidental quality. Now, St. Thomas goes on to explain that there are four species of accidental quality. Virtue and vice are accidental qualities, but in which of these four species? According to Aquinas, there are four species of accidental quality, modes determining a subject accidentally. The first species is the mode determining a subject with respect to the nature of that subject. So it's an accidental determination of a subject that is related to the nature of the subject in its ordering towards an end. The second species of quality is a mode determining the subject with respect to action. So it determines something with respect to what that thing does. The third species of accidental quality is a mode determining the subject with respect to passion. The fourth species of accidental quality is a mode determining the subject with respect to quantity. An example of the fourth species is triangular, circular, round, and straight. All of these accidental qualities fall in the fourth species of accidental quality. They can be called quantitative qualities. Their subject is a body with quantity. And again, we call them quantitative qualities. So when I say the fourth species of accidental quality or the fourth species of quality, think of quantitative qualities like triangular, circular, round, and straight. Let's look at examples of the third species of quality. Examples of this are blue, hot, cold, sweet, and bitter. These have for their subject a mobile body, that is a body capable of being moved. These are called sensible qualities because they're things that we can sense with our five external senses. Blue we sense with our eyes, hot and cold we sense with our sense of touch, and sweet and bitter we sense with our tongue or or our power of uh, taste. The second species of quality is called natural powers. Examples of this are intellect and will, which have for their subject the soul, and sight, touch, taste, and sense appetites, which have for their subject the body soul composite. So now we have three species of quality. Uh, the fourth species is the quantitative qualities like triangular and circular. The third species are the sensible qualities like blue, hot, and sweet. And the second species are the natural powers like intellect, will, sight, touch, taste, and sense appetites. That is, all the powers of the soul. These first three, or these last three species of quality are all called simple qualities. The first species of quality embodies all of the composite qualities. These are based on an order pre-existing in simple qualities. So the first species of quality uh, is a quality that determines, or is a mode determining, pre-existent qualities in their order to one another or to something else. Now, let's look a little more closely at what's contained in the first species of quality, that is, all of these composite qualities. Now, the name that Aquinas and Aristotle give to this first species of quality is habits and dispositions, and this name gives us a clue to what's contained in this first species. Now, there, since composite qualities are based on simple qualities, there are two kinds of composite qualities, or habits and dispositions. Some are based on the natural powers, or powers of the soul, and some are based on either sensible qualities or quantitative qualities. So there are two kinds of habits and dispositions. There are uh, those that are in the body, and these are called just dispositions. 
and these are based on sensible qualities and quantitative qualities. On the other hand, there are qualities in the soul which are called habits. These are based on the ordering of natural powers. So notice that the foundation for uh, qualities in the first species, which are in the body, are sensible qualities and quantitative qualities. Whereas the foundation for uh, this first species of quality in the soul is the natural powers which are found in the soul, such as intellect, will, sight, touch, taste, and sense appetites. Now, the subject of uh, the the subject of dispositions is the body with sensible and quantitative qualities. In other words, it's a body that already has certain simple qualities which then have to be further determined by the mode, which is a quality in the first species. Examples of dispositions are health, sickness, beauty, and ugliness. Now, you could understand why these are called qualities in the first species as opposed to one of the other species, because they are uh, composite qualities, modes determining simple qualities in the other species. For instance, Beauty is based on having a certain complexion and shape and th that uh, causes pleasure. So beauty is composed of certain sensible qualities and quantitative qualities. Likewise, health requires having a certain temperature. For instance, if you're 101 degrees, you have a fever. So if you um, adjust the temperature in such a way that it's beneficial to your nature, such that it's conducive for the survival of your body, then that's called health. So notice that health is based on a certain sensible quality, namely heat. You can't have the, the quality in the first species of quality, health, unless you have qualities in the third species, such as heat. The same thing goes for ugliness and beauty. Ugliness, for instance, requires a certain um, poorly ordered relationship between sensible qualities and quantitative qualities. Likewise, sickness requires that same uh, or a different sort of um, disorder among sensible qualities and quantitative qualities such that it's bad for your health. Now, besides dispositions, which as we said are qualities in the first species which are in the body and based on the third and fourth species of quality, there are also habits, which are in the soul, and they're based on the second species of quality. So these have for their subject the soul's powers. Examples of uh, habits, that is, qualities in the first species, which are based on the natural powers of the soul, are virtue and vice. So virtue and vice are quality in the first species in the soul. They have for their foundation or subject the soul's powers. So now we've seen that virtue and vice are in the category accidental quality, or we'll usually just say quality. Virtue and vice are qualities, but then we could ask what sort of qualities are they? Well, there are four species of quality. There's the first species, habits and dispositions, which consists of all the composite qualities. And then there are the next three species. The second species, which is called natural powers. The third species, which is called sensible qualities. And the fourth species, which is called quantitative qualities. We've just put virtue and vice within the first species. It's a habit or disposition. It's a quality determining a subject that already has certain other qualities that have to be ordered to one another or to something else. But there are two kinds of quality in the first species. There are uh, one qualities in the body, which are called dispositions, and there's qualities in the soul, which are called habits. Now, the qualities in the soul are, have for their subject the powers of the soul. So virtue and vice have for their subject the soul's powers, and they are qualities within the first species. In other words, they are habits. 
Just as health and beauty are qualities by which the simple qualities of the body, such as color, temperature, and shape, are well-ordered, so too virtue is a quality of the soul by which the powers of the soul are well-ordered. Likewise, vice is like a sickness or ugliness of soul, resulting from the disorder of the soul's powers. So for an easy way to think about virtue and vice is to compare them to what's more obvious to us, namely health and beauty on the one hand and ugliness and sickness on the other hand. Just as health and beauty are good qualities of the body and sickness and ugliness are bad qualities of the body, so too virtue is the well ordering of the qualities of the soul and vice is the poorly ordering of the qualities of the soul. Virtue is like health and beauty of soul, and vice is like sickness or ugliness of soul. Now, someone who has virtue is called virtuous, and someone who has vice is called vicious. Both virtue and vice are habits, that is, qualities by which the powers of the soul are ordered. Just as beauty and ugliness are qualities by which the simple qualities of the body are ordered, so too virtue and vice are qualities by which the simple qualities of the soul, that is, the soul's powers, are ordered. Therefore, the subject of both virtue and vice is the same, namely the powers of the soul. Virtue differs from vice because virtue is a good habit, but vice a bad habit. Now, powers of the soul are by nature directed towards actions, remembering, knowing, loving, and hating. Therefore, the distinction between good and bad habits will depend on how those habits dispose the powers of the soul with respect to action. As we saw before, virtues are good habits in the powers of the soul by which those habits are ordered towards action. But there are different sorts of powers in the soul over which we exercise control. There are appetites, such as the will, con the concupiscible appetite, and the irascible appetite, and there is the intellect, which is an apprehensive power as opposed to an appetitive power or appetite. Now, corresponding to, to these different powers are different virtues. Now, the intellect can be considered in two ways. It can be considered either as simply ordered towards knowledge for its own sake, in which case we have the speculative intellect, or it can be considered as ordered towards knowledge for the sake of some further end or goal. These are not two different powers, the practical intellect and speculative intellect. They're the same power of the intellect, but the intellect can be considered in two different ways, either as a speculative intellect that is ordered towards knowledge for its own sake, or as a practical intellect considered as ordered towards useful knowledge or knowledge for the sake of some further end or goal. Now, there are certain virtues which correspond to the speculative intellect. Now, there are also two kinds of virtues which correspond to the practical intellect. On the one hand, the practical intellect is perfected by the virtue of art, or craft, or technique, or skill. All of these names mean roughly the same thing. And art is right reason about things to be done. It's ordered towards an external product. For instance, a house, a chair, or a symphony or a painting. All of these things are external products, and insofar as the practical intellect is perfected by a virtue such that it's capable of producing these products, it's perfected by art, the virtue which perfects the practical intellect insofar as it's ordered towards external products is art. On the other hand, prudence also is a virtue perfecting the practical intellect. Prudence can also be called practical wisdom. It is not right reason about things to be made, but right reason about things to be done. That is, it's ordered towards human action as opposed to some external product, such as a house or chair. So there are three virtues, or three categories of virtues, that perfect the intellect. These are all intellectual virtues. There's prudence, there's art, and then there's the virtues which perfect the speculative intellect. On the other hand, there are also moral virtues. Moral virtues overlap with intellectual virtues, but they're not the same thing. Virtue, 
either perfects a power of the soul with respect to the ability to do an action and the inclination to do the action, or it perfects a power of the soul with respect to do the, action, the ability to do the action, but not with respect to the inclination to do the action. So moral virtues are more perfectly virtues than virtues which are not moral virtues, such as art and the virtues of the speculative intellect. Prudence is an intellectual virtue, but it's also a moral virtue because it entails not only a perfection of the soul with respect to the ability to do certain actions, but also with respect to its own desiring or inclina inclination towards that sort of action. Intellectual virtues make the possessor good in some one respect. For instance, someone is called smart, or a good paint carpenter, or a good musician, because of intellectual virtues that aren't moral virtues. But moral virtues make the possessor good simply speaking, and without any qualification added. For instance, a moral person is said to be good, not simply as a carpenter or a musician, but simply good. He's simply a good human. As we saw before, virtues of the speculative intellect are not moral virtues. They don't make the possessor a good person or inclined to act well, but only capable of acting well, with respect to knowledge. There are three speculative virtues. The first is understanding. In Latin, this is called intellectus, and it's that from which we get the, the word intellect. Now, understanding is the virtue or habit by which the possessor is able to know self-evident principles. Now, you may wonder, why do we need a habit or virtue allowing us to know self-evident principles? Well, self-evident principles should not be confused with things that we always know. It's not the case that we always know self-evident principles, even though they're self-evident. Rather, being self-evident means that we know these things once the terms of the proposition that is known are understood. So, for instance, when we know what a bachelor is and what it is to be unmarried, then we immediately assent to the proposition that all bachelors are unmarried. Nevertheless, it might not be the case that we always know this proposition is true because we aren't always thinking about the parts of the proposition. So understanding is the virtue which allows us to ascend to self-evident principles quickly. Now the second intellect or speculative intellectual virtue is called science or in Latin scientia. Science is the habit by which the possessor is able to know something about a particular class of things through something else. For instance, geometry concludes that the interior angles of a triangle must equal to right angles by reasoning from the definition of a triangle to this conclusion. So notice that with understanding we assent to self-evident principles, but with science we assent to conclusions which are known by means of those self-evident principles. So science builds on the habit of understanding. But what science knows is different from what understanding knows. Understanding knows self-evident principles, but science knows conclusions which are known through self-evident principles. Here's another example. The astronomer proves that the Earth is round by reasoning from the circular shadow that the Earth casts on the moon when interposed between the moon and the sun. So the astronomer has a certain self-evident principle, namely that the Earth casts a round shadow on the moon, and he reasons from this self-evident principle, which he can see with his eyes, to a further conclusion, namely that the Earth is round. This conclusion is not something that he can see with his eyes, rather it's something he has to reason to from a self-evident principle. Now, the third kind of speculative intellectual virtue is wisdom which in Latin is called sapientia, and in Greek, sophia. This is a habit by which the possessor is able to know something about being in general through something else. So notice that this is very similar to science. Science knows one thing through something else that's self-evident. It knows something non-self-evident through something self-evident, which is the evidence for that non-self-evident thing or conclusion. 
The same is true of wisdom. The way wisdom differs from science, or scientia, is that whereas science concerns some particular class of things, such as uh, geometrical objects or the celestial bodies, wisdom knows all things. It knows being in general. So it forms conclusions not about some particular class of things, but about, but about things or beings generally. That's why wisdom is called wisdom because wisdom governs other things. The one who is wise is the one who governs others. Likewise, wisdom, being the most general science, governs all, the other, all other branches of knowledge. Both science and wisdom reach conclusions by reasoning from prior understanding, that is, prior knowledge of self-evident principles. Since, however, wisdom is about all being, not just one special class of being, like science, wisdom is not only not only reaches conclusions from prior knowledge, but also defends the truth of self-evident principles employed by the different sciences. So wisdom embraces within itself not only something like science, but also something like understanding. It concerns not only conclusions, but even the most general self-evident principles, which are employed by all the particular sciences. Thus, wisdom is said to judge all of the sciences and to be about the highest causes. Metaphysics and sacred theology are distinct habits, but both are, in a way, the same thing as wisdom. On the last slide, we looked at the speculative intellectual virtues. Now let's look at the practical intellectual virtues. These are virtues perfecting the intellect insofar as it's practical, or the practical intellect. As we said before, the practical and speculative intellect are not different powers, but different ways of considering the same power, namely the intellect. So the first practical virtue, or practical intellectual virtue, is art, which can also be called craft, technique, or skill. This, as we said before, is right reason about things to be made. The second practical intellectual virtue is prudence, also called practical wisdom. This is right reason about things to be done, not about things to be made. So art is a habit rendering the possessor capable of producing a certain effect or product. Not a moral virtue, but uh, because habit doesn't make the possessor want to make the effect or product, only to be able to do so. So art is not a moral virtue, merely an intellectual virtue. Prudence, on the other hand, is both an intellectual virtue and a moral virtue. The difference between non-moral virtues and moral virtues, as we saw before, is whether or not the virtue makes the possessor of that virtue want to do the thing towards which the virtue inclines. Art does not make you want to do the thing towards which the art inclines you. So, for instance, a painter might be capable of painting beautiful paintings, but not want to and choose to make an ugly one. Now, prudence is a habit rendering the possessor capable of acting a certain way and inclined to do so. So this adds beyond what art does, the inclination to do the thing towards which the habit uh, it makes the possessor capable. Therefore, prudence, unlike art, is a moral virtue. Prudence is a habit in the intellect, but it presupposes a virtue in the will by which the will orders the intellect to the last end, or highest good. So prudence is in the intellect, that is the subject of prudence. Nevertheless, prudence requires that the will be disposed in a certain way, namely towards the last end, or highest good, happiness. Someone who has a bad will, not inclined towards true happiness, cannot have true prudence. Such a person may be cunning, and thus called prudent by analogy, but they aren't prudent properly speaking. Think, for instance, of Odysseus in the book The Odyssey. Odysseus is cunning. He always comes up with a way of getting out of problems and of cheating people to get what he wants. Nevertheless, even though we might call Odysseus prudent by analogy, Odysseus isn't literally prudent because he isn't inclined towards the ultimate end. He's not moral. He is cunning, 
And so we can call him prudent since he looks like someone who's prudent, but he's not actually prudent because prudence, strictly speaking, requires that the will be well inclined towards true happiness. Prudence perfects the intellect so that it can judge the best means to the highest good, that is, true happiness. Therefore, one whose intellect is not ordered to the highest good is not actually or truly prudent. Although prudence presupposes an inclination in the will towards the last end, that is, true happiness, prudence itself is properly concerned with knowing the means to that end, not with the prior act of knowing the end itself. So, Prudence does not have to do with cognition or knowledge of the end. Rather, strictly speaking, prudence has to do with knowledge of the means and ordering a person towards the right means to obtain the true end. Nevertheless, prudence presupposes that there is knowledge of the true end and an inclination in the will towards that known end. So now we've ge given a general account of what art is and what prudence is and how these differ from each other. In summary, art is a habit of reason ordered towards an effect or product, that is something external which is made. On the other hand, prudence is a habit of reason ordered towards human action, not towards some external effect. Okay, now that we've established the general character of prudence and art, let's subdivide both of these virtues. Prudence is subdivided because the acts of reason towards human action are several. First, there's the act of deliberation or counsel. This is an inquiry into the best means to an end. So if we're going to have right reason about things to be done, we first need to deliberate or take counsel about what are the best means to be done to achieve the end. Next, there's the act of judgment. This is a conclusion of inquiry into the means to the end. So there's not only a virtue for deliberation and counsel, which falls under prudence, but also under prudence there's a virtue inclining us to form correct judgments or correct conclusions in our inquiries about the best means to the end. And finally, there's a virtue called command, which falls underneath prudence, and which perfects our act of reason, by which the will moves the body to execute chosen means. Command is an act of reason most immediately connected to external human actions. So there's a virtue not only for deliberation, that is, the action by which we reason about the means to an end, but there's also a virtue for judgment, our, our conclusions, and there's also a virtue for command by which we order external bodily action by the intellect being moved by the will towards the end which it's chosen. Now underneath judgment there are two virtues. On the one hand there are judgments based on the principles of natural law. These are scientific moral judgments where we actually understand why something is wrong by reasoning about it from the natural law. On the other hand, there are judgments that we reach in practical matters which are not based on the natural law or ultimate principles, but rather based on common opinion. For instance, most people would say that murder is wrong. They would reach that judgment. That's a good judgment. However, they wouldn't be able to explain why murder is wrong. They wouldn't be able to reason to this conclusion from the natural law. Rather, they would say murder is wrong just based on the common opinion of most people. That's perfectly legitimate. So there's a virtue perfecting the intellect uh, with respect to deliberation, which is one act. There's also a virtue perfecting the intellect with respect to command, which is another act. And then there's also two virtues perfecting the intellect with respect to the act of judgment. One perfects the intellect with respect to reason, uh, the judgment following from the natural law, and one perfects the practical intellect with respect to the judgment following from common opinions. That virtue would make someone good at, at following the right common opinions about what ought to be done. In some, then, there's four virtues falling underneath prudence. All of these are in some way prudence, but most of all we call prudent the one who makes good commands. The virtue perfecting the act of command is what makes someone prudent properly so called, 
it presupposes prudence in the other uh, in the other ways as well. Technically, however, the virtue perfecting our act of deliberation is called eustochia. And technically, the virtue perfecting our judgments based on the natural law is called senesis. And finally, the virtue perfecting our judgments based on common opinion is called nome. So although eustochia, senesis, and nome are all called prudence, what is properly called prudence is the virtue perfecting our act of command. Okay, so on the last slide we saw that prudence is a general virtue that includes other virtues, such as eustochia, senesis, nome, and what's prudence properly so called. Likewise, art includes several virtues. It's not just one virtue. On the one hand, there are mechanical or servile arts. On the other hand, there are liberal arts. Mechanical arts have a product that is for the sake of the body. For instance, medicine, engineering, cooking, software design, and military strategy all aim at producing something which in itself is ordered towards the good of the body. Of course, someone could use engineering or cooking in such a way to harm the body, but the product of these arts as such is for the sake of the body. Now, liberal arts have a product that itself is for the sake of forming the soul, disposing it to more easily acquire the moral and speculative virtues. That's why liberal arts are called liberal, or free, as opposed to mechanical or servile. That's because mechanical arts, or servile arts, serve the body, but liberal arts are for something that is a free action, an action of a human, for the moral and speculative virtues. Now, there are seven liberal arts. First, there is the trivium, which consists of three liberal arts, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Secondly, there is the quadrivium, this consists of four liberal arts, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. These seven liberal arts are designed to form the soul such that it is capable of going on to practice the speculative and moral virtues. These arts are not practiced for their own sake, but for the sake of allowing the person who possesses them to live a free or liberal life, that is, a life ordered towards moral perfection, and intellectual perfection. They are compatible with the mechanical and servile arts insofar as we certainly need the servile and mechanical arts in order to maintain the health and well-being of the body such that we can live the free life of the intellect and morals. At this point, we've gone over all of the intellectual virtues. The virtues perfecting the speculative intellect, as we saw, were understanding, science, and wisdom. And the virtues perfecting the practical intellect were the virtues falling under art and the virtues falling under prudence. Now let's discuss the moral virtues. Now, as we saw before, moral virtues differ from virtues that aren't moral from the fact that moral virtues not only give the ability to do an action, but also the inclination or desire to do that action. One can have a virtue such that they're capable of thinking well, or of knowing something, but no inclination actually to know it or do it. A very clear example of this is a painter, who again has the ability to paint, but doesn't actually desire to paint something well. Moral virtues convey not only the ability, but also the desire or inclination. So far, we've been discussing the intellectual virtues. As we saw, one of the intellectual virtues, namely prudence, is also a moral virtue. But most moral virtues are in the appetites. Now, as we saw in a previous video, there are several appetites in the soul. There are the sense appetites, and then there's the will, or rational appetite. The will follows the apprehension of the intellect, or reason, thus it's called rational appetite. 
and the sense appetites follow the apprehension of the senses, that is, what the senses perceive to be good or bad. Now, there are two sense appetites. There's the irascible appetite, and this pertains to the arduous good and the arduously avoided evil, and the concupiscible appetite, which pertains to good and evil as apprehended by the senses without qualification. In other words, the irascible appetite has to do with what's difficult but still good, and the concupiscible appetite has to do with what's good without qualification. Therefore, there are four powers in the soul in which moral virtue is found, namely the intellect, in which we find the moral virtue of prudence, the will, or rational appetite, in which we find the moral virtue of justice, the irascible appetite, in which we find the moral virtue of fortitude or courage, and then finally the concupiscible appetite, in which we find the moral virtue of temperance or moderation. The four cardinal virtues are the principal moral virtues. There are other moral virtues besides these four, but all other moral virtues are subordinated to these four. There are two virtues regulating operations of the rational part of the soul, that is, the intellect and will. And likewise, there are two virtues regulating the passions of the sense appetites so that they are obedient to reason. In the rational part of the soul, we find prudence. This is, an, uh, con is a virtue perfecting the operation of the intellect. And we find justice, which is a virtue perfecting the operation of the will, or the rational appetite, with respect to the common good. Now, the virtues pertaining to the passions of the sense appetites are fortitude, or courage, and temperance, or moderation. Fortitude renders the passions of the irascible appetite obedient to reason. For instance, this will allow us not to get angry beyond what is the, uh, called for by reason, or to get angry when reason calls for us to be angry. On the other hand, temperance will do things like regulating our desire for food and sexual relations in a way that's in conformity with reason. Now, let's look at justice a little more closely. There is no moral virtue regulating the will with respect to the individual's own good, since a person's will is inclined towards his own happiness necessarily. But we do not necessarily will the happiness of civil society, or the common good. Therefore, a special virtue, namely justice, is needed to order the will not only towards the individual's own good, which the will is inclined towards in any case, but also towards the good of society, which the will does need a special virtue to be ordered towards. So there are four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Prudence is in the intellect, justice is in the will, fortitude is in the irascible appetite, and temperance is in the concupiscible appetite. Prudence and justice both belong to the rational part of the soul, that is, to the intellect and to the will. Fortitude and temperance both belong to the sentient or animal part of the soul. That is, the part of the soul which ought to be obedient to reason and not directing things. As noted before, the four cardinal virtues are the principal moral virtues, but not the only moral virtues. They are not the only moral virtues, but all moral virtues can be categorized underneath one of the four cardinal virtues, by analogy to that virtue. To see what this looks like, let's take a closer look at the most important cardinal virtue, namely justice, and see which moral virtues are placed underneath it. We'll look at both the ways in which we can divide justice into virtues annexed to justice, but which are not justice strictly so called, and the ways in which we can divide justice into virtues which are species of justice. This is two different kinds of divisions of justice. On the one hand, we're dividing justice into virtues which themselves are not justice, but which are called justice insofar as they are annexed to justice by some sort of analogy or relation of dependence. 
and on the other hand, a division of justice into its own proper species, that is, things which are justice, strictly speaking, or properly so called. So we're going to look at both of these divisions in the next two slides. Let's first look at justice not according to its proper species, but rather according to those other moral virtues which, strictly speaking, are not justice, but nevertheless are annexed to justice or reduced to justice by some sort of analogy or relation of dependence. This will help us show what it, what it means for something to be a cardinal virtue, that is, one of the principal virtues to which all other moral virtues, even though they're different moral virtues, will be reduced. Now, to understand this annexing process, we first need to be clear on what justice is, strictly speaking. Justice, strictly speaking, is the virtue by which one renders to another what is his legally owed, or due, according to strict equality. So, there are several parts to this definition. First, it's a virtue, and it re renders, uh, uh, this virtue makes one render to another what is due or owed to that other person. Moreover, what is due must be legally due, that is, by law. And finally, what is owed must be paid in strict equality, not just in some vague or in unequal way. So there are several parts to this definition. First, it's a virtue. Secondly, it concerns rendering to another what they are, what they are due or owed. And then thirdly, that the owing has to be a legal kind of owing, an owing from the law. And finally, the owing uh, needs to be uh, returned according to strict equality and not, in, not according to some deficient return. Now, this strict notion of justice allows us to come up with a more broad or analogical notion of justice, which can apply to things which aren't justice, strictly speaking, but can be called justice by analogy. The analogical notion of justice is that justice is the virtue by which one renders to another what is owed, or due, according to equality. Notice we've omitted the notion of legal owing. And we've also omitted the notion of strict equality. Now, uh, some virtues fall under this analogical notion of justice, but they don't, uh, they don't perfect someone with respect to returning what is owed with respect to perfect equality. So they fall short of perfect or strictly so-called justice in terms of strict equality. The virtues that fall into this category are uh, piety and religion. Now, piety is the virtue by which we render to our parents and our nation what is owed to them, but without being able to return anything equal to the gift of life, education, etc., which they have given to us. So, notice that piety falls under justice by analogy, but it doesn't meet the perfect notion of justice because when we are perfected by piety, we're still incapable of repaying what we owe according to strict equality. No one can give back to their parents the gift of life and education. Likewise, religion falls under, vir under the virtue of justice by analogy, but not perfectly, because religion is the virtue by which we render God what is owed to him, but falling far short of a return equal to what God has given, which is precisely everything good that we have received. So notice that both piety and religion fall short of an equal return on what is owed. Therefore, although both are similar to justice strictly so called, and both are called justice by analogy, neither are true uh, instances of the virtue of justice strictly so called. That does not mean that these aren't true virtues. They are true moral virtues. They are called justice, but they're not justice strictly so called. They're merely annexed to the virtue of justice by a kind of analogy.
Now, other virtues are also annexed to the virtue of justice, but for another reason. These are the virtues that render someone what they are only morally owed, but not legally owed. Here, we're falling short not in the notion of equality, but in the notion of legal owe, or legal due. So as we said before, justice, strictly speaking, requires that we're rendering someone what they're legally due. Here, we're talking about virtues which do not render someone what they're legally due, but only morally due. So again, these virtues are not going to be justice strictly so called, but they will be called justice by a kind of analogy. Now, there are two kinds falling here uh, under this, these uh, sorts of virtues. Sometimes um, virtues render someone what they are morally owed, such that the moral rectitude is lost if the rendering does not take place. On the other hand, sometimes moral rectitude is retained even if the, the rendering of what someone is due does not take place. To make this concrete, let's look at some examples. Courtesy is an example of a virtue whereby if we do not render someone what they're due, we do not thereby lose moral rectitude. If you're not polite, you don't lose moral rectitude by not giving people the politeness that they are owed. On the other hand, as we saw, there are moral virtues where you do lose rectitude, moral rectitude, if you do not render someone what they're owed. This can be subdivided into two kinds. First of all, the obligation in virtue of which we would lose moral rectitude if we didn't render someone what they're owed, may be because of the one obligated, not because of the one to whom there is an obligation. Here we have the virtue of truthfulness or honesty. If I do not render someone the truth that they are owed, I lose moral rectitude, not because of the person to whom I'm speaking, but because of myself, the one obligated. Thus, we have the virtue of truthfulness or honesty. On the other hand, sometimes the obligation is in virtue of the one owed something, not in virtue of the one obligated. Now, if what is owed is something good, then we have the virtue of gratitude. And what if what is owed is something evil, or that is a punishment, then we have the virtue of legal vengeance as opposed to vigilante vig uh, vengeance, which is not a uh, virtue at all. So let's make this a little more concrete by giving examples of actions falling under each of these virtues annexed to justice. So an example of piety would be the uh, act of showing reverence to your parents calling them father or mother, dad or mom, as opposed to calling them by their first name. That would be an example of an act of piety. Likewise, showing reverence to the flag of your nation is an example of piety. It's an attempt to re return to something that has benefited you, what they've given you, but in a way that never uh, reaches equality with the benefit you've received. The virtue of religion is exemplified by actions like public worship or giving money to the church. These are actions which return to God what he has given you, but not in a way that comes anywhere close to equality with what you owe. Examples of truthfulness and honesty are actions where we portray ourselves how we are as opposed to acting as if we're a different sort of person than we are. So if we pretend to be virtuous or to be chaste, but aren't actually living in that sort of way, that would go against the virtue of truthfulness or honesty. Likewise, if we tell a lie, that goes against the virtue of truthfulness or honesty. Let's look at an example of gratitude. In the case of gratitude, we owe someone something good, and we, we would 
uh, lose moral rectitude if we did not give them what we owe. So if someone has given us, let's say, a free car um, in order to help us out, if we do not uh, return gratitude to them, we don't say thank you or uh, take them out to dinner or something. If we haven't done some act of gratitude to pay them back, then we have not actually uh, fulfilled our duty and we've lost moral rectitude. We've done something wrong because we owe them good in return for the benefit they've given us. Nevertheless, what we owe them is not, a is not a legal obligation, but only a moral obligation. You're not going to be taken to jail for not being grateful. Let's look at an example of legal vengeance, which is also a virtue, just like gratitude. If someone does something to you which is, uh, which is harmful and unjust, then you have an obligation to pursue legal action against them in a way that's proportionate to the action that they took against you. So, for instance, if, uh, if someone hits your car um, and uh, you have serious damage to your car, you have an obligation to pursue le legal action against them or to at least um, receive remuneration for what they've done to you. Otherwise, you're not being a responsible steward of the things that belong to you. So this would be the virtue of legal vengeance. It's knowing when and to what extent to pursue punishment or harm to others for the harm they've done to you, through the legal means, of course. Finally, there's the virtue of courtesy. This is a virtue where we don't lose moral rectitude by not giving someone what they're owed. Nevertheless, it is a virtue to give them what they're owed and there is a virtue that perfects us such that we're inclined to do so. So all of these virtues, courtesy or politeness, legal vengeance, gratitude, truthfulness and honesty, religion and piety, all of these are annexed to justice. They're not species of justice because they're not examples of justice strictly so called. They don't meet the complete definition of justice. Nevertheless, because of a certain analogy to justice, we call them all kinds of justice, even though, strictly speaking, they aren't. This is a good example of what it means to say that something is a cardinal virtue. It's a virtue towards which other moral virtues are annexed, even though those moral virtues really are other virtues, not the same thing as justice itself. Piety, religion, truthfulness, gratitude, legal vengeance, and courtesy are not the same thing as the cardinal virtues of justice, strictly speaking. Nevertheless, we categorize these virtues underneath the cardinal virtue of justice since they participate the notion of justice to some extent, even if they still fall short of the strict notion of justice. On the last slide, we looked at virtues that are annexed to the cardinal virtue of justice. This gave us a sense of what it meant to, for something to be annexed to justice. These virtues are not identical to the virtue of justice, strictly speaking. They are distinct virtues, but we categorize them under the virtue of justice insofar as they have some sort of analogical similarity to justice in the strict sense. On this slide, however, we will look at different virtues that are called justice, properly speaking. These aren't merely annexed to justice, they literally are justice. They are species of justice. The virtues in this slide are not annexed to justice. They have the full definition or notion of justice within themselves. Nevertheless, they subdivide justice as a species divides a genus. Just like a human and an ox and a horse all meet the full definition of what it is to be an animal, nevertheless they're distinct species of the genus animal. Similarly, there are several species of justice, each of which meets the full definition of justice. So notice that this is a totally different division of justice than we saw on the last slide. On the last slide, we're looking at things which don't meet the full definition of justice, but which are nevertheless called justice by a kind of analogy or annexation. 
On this slide, we're looking at vir moral virtues, which really do meet the full definition of justice and are called justice properly speaking, but nevertheless are distinct from each other as different species within the same genus. Now, there is a uh, first and foremost, a twofold division of justice. On the one hand, there's legal justice, which concerns others in general. On the other hand, there's particular justice, which concerns another person in particular. So legal justice has to do with um, giving others their due in general, and particular justice has to do with um, giving an other person in particular his or her due. Both of these meet the full definition of justice, as we've already suggested. Both of them are a virtue by which one renders to another what is his legally owed or due according to strict equality. But particular justice has to do with a particular person. Legal justice has to do with others in general. Legal justice orders the possessor immediately to the civil common good and immediately to the private good of particular individuals. That is, legal justice orders us immediately to the common good and immediately to private goods of particular individuals. For this reason, legal justice is also called general justice. This is just another name for legal justice. The reason we call legal justice general justice is because the acts of all the other virtues, for instance, temperance, fortitude, etc., can be considered as acts of justice insofar as they are ordered towards the common good. For instance, if I eat a rational amount, that is, if I control my, uh, my bodily appetites, with my reason, not for my own personal happiness, but for the sake of benefiting society at large, so that I'm healthy and I can work, work more efficiently, such that I can produce things to benefit society, then my act of temperance is not only an act of temperance, but it's even an act of justice because it's ordered towards the common good. That is, it's ordered towards giving others what they're due in general. Thus, the Acts of all of the lower virtues, such as temperance, fortitude, etc., can become acts of justice insofar as the virtue of justice orders those acts not only towards the individual's own happiness, but also towards the common good. That's why legal justice can also be called general justice. Both of these words are designating one and the same virtue. Now, particular justice is subdivided in to two kinds, commutative justice and distributive justice. Commutative justice concerns the relation of one part of society or an individual to another individual or another part of society. Distributive justice concerns the relation of society as a whole to its parts. It's called distributive because it concerns the proportionate distribution of society's common goods, such as honors, offices, and natural resources. So if we're looking at the virtue governing the distribution of these common goods within society, the honors, offices, and natural resources available to that society, then this proportionate distribution falls under the virtue of distributive justice. On the other hand, if we're looking at how two individuals are related to each other in a good or a bad way, that concerns commutative justice. Commutative justice itself is subdivided. On the one hand, there's economic justice. Economic justice is a kind of commutative justice which renders equality in voluntary exchanges. If I give the vending machine company $1.75, they owe me a bag of M&Ms worth $1.75. That's an equality of exchange between individuals or parts of society, which is governed by the virtue of economic justice. On the other hand, there's retributive justice. This corrects inequality in interactions between members of society. 
First, there's um, the need to restore equality between individuals. So if you stole $5, you have to give $5 back. This is the principle we call an eye for an eye. The first thing that restorative justice concerns is the restitution of equality between individuals who have been made unequal by an unequal interaction between those individuals. So this is the idea of an eye for an eye. You stole $5, you have to give that $5 back. But that's not the end of the story with retributive justice. There more, there's more to it. The second thing that retri retributive justice requires us to do is restore equality not only between the two individuals, but between the criminal and society at large. The criminal, by committing the crime or doing an unequal exchange, put himself or herself above the common good. Therefore, we must now put them below the common good, below the position to which they naturally belong. This can be done in one of three ways, either through imprisonment, which is effectively a form of slavery or loss of liberty, through corporal punishment, which is a loss of bodily safety. This would be things like um, scourging or, um, or having to stand out in the open in, uh, in Iraq. And finally, through capital punishment, which is the loss of life. So there are several species of justice that fall under justice strictly so called. First and foremost, justice is uh, divided into legal justice and particular justice. Legal justice, again, as we said, could be called general justice because it in a way encapsulates or can encapsulate the acts of all the other virtues insofar as those virtues are ordered by justice towards the common good. Besides legal justice, which orders us to the common good or the good of others in general, there's also particular justice, which orders us to the good of particular individuals. Underneath particular justice, we have commutative justice and distributive justice. Commutative justice concerns the relation of one part of society to another, and distributive justice concerns the proportionate distribution of the goods that society has to distribute, honors, offices, and natural resources. Commutative justice is subdivided into economic justice, which has to do with voluntary exchanges, such as my buying something from a vending machine or a store, and retributive justice, which has to do with rectifying inequality in involuntary exchanges. And this itself has two components. First, we must restore equality. If you took $5, you have to give it back. And secondly, we have to restore equality between the criminal and society at large by uh, subordinating the criminal to society in a way beyond what they were before. So insofar as the criminal has put themselves above society, now they need to be put below their natural position. So these are all species of justice. They're things which meet the full definition of justice and which fall underneath that virtue. This goes to give an example of the difference between annexing a moral virtue to a cardinal virtue and dividing a cardinal virtue into its proper species. On the previous slide, we saw virtues annexed to justice. On this slide, we have seen virtues which literally are justice, just its species. So something similar to what we've done on this slide can be done for the other cardinal virtues, for prudence, fortitude, and temperance. But here we've just given justice as an example, since justice is the most important of the cardinal virtues.